Hello, hi. I'm Alana Rabinovich, and I'm pleased to introduce this evening's panel called Banned Books, Censorship and the Erasure of History and Experience. Tonight, we're going to talk about an insidious menace, the trend toward denying children and adults alike access to books. Some people have decided what we shouldn't have the right to read, whether it's Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale or Lawrence Hill's The Book of Negroes, established and emerging writers are under threat. With us tonight is Peter Midgley, former writer in residence of Queen's University. Peter will moderate tonight's panel. Our panelists include Matt Abbott, Manager of Collection Development at Toronto Public Library. Matt recently curated an entire collection of banned and challenged books in his book sanctuary at the Toronto Reference Library. Arlene Perley Ray, former book reviewer at the Toronto Star and the award-winning author of Everybody's Favorites, Canadians, Canadians Talk About Books That Changed Their Lives. Then we have Raziel Reed, whose 2014 Governor General's Award winning When Everything Feels Like the Movies was banned, was banned for coarse language and depiction of gay lifestyle. Lastly, we welcome David A. Robertson. His novel, The Great Bear, was removed from schools by an Ontario school board. Please take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Peter will take as many questions as possible at around 7.45. So without further ado, here is Peter and the rest of the crew. Hi, good evening, and Alana, thank you very, very much for organizing this power panel. It's disturbing that we need to have this conversation in 2023, but uh, here we are. So let me jump right in. Raziel, um, so many of the current spate of challenges seem to be occasioned and concerned, occasioned by and concerned with sex and homophobia. So, especially so when it deals with books for children and the youth. Now, your book, of course, um, is a response to such attacks. And let's start with, is it going to get better or is it going to get worse? Uh, I think it's constantly fluctuating. Rights are far easily um, maintained than they are earned. And one of the reasons why a conversation like this is so important um, is because we're seeing a regression of queer rights and rights for trans people that is mirroring the censorship of literature. Now, in terms of writers, how do how do writers respond to this kind of these kind of attacks and this? fluctuating pressure? Oh, well, I think that we can only respond by continuing to write. I'm reminded of uh, Queen Consort Queen Camilla's recent comments when she defended um, Roald Dahl, whose works are being censored and rewritten. Um, she said, uh, and I quote, remain true to your calling, unimpeded by those who may wish to curb the freedom of your expression or impose limits on um, your imagination. I love that quote because limits on your imagination are limits on your humanity. And we understand who we are as a people based on what we can read and what we can write and what we can access. And there are nefarious powers at play that want to limit the scope of what's available to us because they want to limit the scope of the human experience. Thank you. Yes. And I, I mean, we can see this as well, uh, for instance, in the the protests at uh, drag story times that libraries often and that that's a, a good uh, segue into a question for you Matt uh, really that I want to ask is libraries are in the crosses yet again I mean this weekend there was a news item about that so you run the book sanctuaries and tell us a little bit more about the book sanctuary and what it does yeah, so um, in general, we've seen an increase in challenges at libraries in North America wide. It's it's certainly more of a an issue in the states at the moment, where there's a, a very coordinated effort to have uh, books removed, and uh, a lot of the time they're tying it to the library's budgets, uh, saying that uh, you know we, we want items removed from the collection. 
Um, the book sanctuary itself is, is a response to that. Um, as we know, things that happen in the States tend to to linger over the border to us. And we've seen some examples of that. As example, in the article you were referencing in uh, in Manitoba, there's a, there was an effort to um, remove books from a library or else, uh, you know, and they were they were they were advocating to defund the library and such. So the, the book sanctuary uh, project is a uh, it's a movement to declare all our hundred libraries at, at Toronto Public Library to be, uh, uh, you know, free for you know books to read and uh, and and have availability of books, but it's also we curated uh, 50 titles um, at the Toronto Reference Library, which you can also see on our website um, of titles that have been challenged or banned in North America. And we've included we've included titles that have been challenged uh, right here in uh, Toronto, um, essentially uh, wanting to bring attention to to the issue. Um, I think those those kinds of initiatives are really really important to not just for solidarity, but to to resist. I think um, the 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 pressures that come in from these the forces that are spilling over from from the U.S. And while we may be able to say, "Oh, it's not happening here. It's not for us," or "Not this isn't a Canadian problem," actually, it is. Um, and increasingly so. So rather be prepared and proactive about that right now, I think. So could you, before I move on, um, because I think this is relevant to, to a question that I want to ask David, is what are the processes that are in place for reviewing a book if it gets challenged? Yeah, good question. So most libraries will have a process to review books. Um, last year, for example, in 2022, we received nine book challenges uh, where folks wanted either things removed from the collection or moved from children's collection to another collection. Um, and we have a process in place. We will review them. If someone has a concern about a book, we make sure to follow our policies, uh, ensuring that you know, um, you know, we we are following our material selections policy. But we are libraries in general are very committed to intellectual freedom. We want to share these ideas of books and such. So generally, um, if an item comes in, we review it. Uh, we will respond to the individual who uh, who um, has uh, has put their concern through. And we also report it to the board too. So at, uh, once a year, we will report all the challenges we had and what we did with the, with each of the books. And, and yet it is not a flawless system because David, I mean, your your book in itself is, <laughs> is, is a case in point of a, a system that appears, a review system that appears flawed in some, in some ways, uh, as I think you yourself have stated. Well, they skipped their system. So it didn't really count, you know. They they ignored their they ignored their own policy. Um, you know, they their their policy was, for example, to um, to keep books on shelves as they reviewed them, um, went through the review process. Um, for mine, they they pulled it instantly um, before they reviewed it, and then. Um, when and then when they went through the process of review, um, you know that that whole process was also um, something that was done outside of their um, their policy framework. Um, and then when I had you know when I had started to advocate for the return of these books to shelves, and there's two other books besides mine, um, they had told me, well, it's different for the, we have a different Indigenous policy for for a book for the book uh, book challenges. And I said, well, where is it then? And then, then, and so I looked for it, I found it, and it said to refer to their policy. So, you know, it was very circular in that way too. But it was, mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, they didn't follow their policy. Um, I think that if you're going to have, you know, um, uh, a good policy in place to address challenges that will come, usually from parents, um, then you, uh, they're your best strategy or your best way to, um, avoid having to pull books is to follow the policy that you put in place. You know, that's the best defense that a library has. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my books were put back because of public pressure, uh, not because of policy. That's, that's interesting. Now, one, um, to stay with you for a minute here, before we move back into the others, is uh, one of the reasons your book was challenged in the end was for having too much culture and ceremony, which is just a, a 
completely bizarre, <laughs> a, a, a bizarre complaint to level against your book. Um, yeah, that that we're if we're in the business of reconciliation, as you say, um, how do we deal with these kinds of criticisms, and how do we how do we get past that, and what where do we stand? Well, the way you get past it is how we did it. You know, we, 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 it, you know, we're, reconciliation is also the development of, of community, you know, uh, and what happened with uh, The Great Bear, which is, you know, there's really nothing controversial about that book. Um, no. But um, the, the, the community rallied around it. So you had teachers, students, librarians, other writers, and myself, um, you know, pressuring the whole school board um, that was that was making these decisions um, to put the book back on the shelves, and and that's you know that's what happened in the end. Um, but you're right, the, the rationale was was ridiculous, but it usually is, you know. So um, they said, you know, uh, not it taught they don't teach culture or ceremony. Um, the thing is, every book is culture, so mm -hmm. they're making a determination to not teach some culture. You know, they were. It's, I guess, you know, ostensibly uh, other cultures were okay to teach. Um, but I, I went through this in Alberta too, you know, and, and Alberta, their, their reasoning was was ludicrous. And that was, you know, that they, it, it required pre and post conversation in the classroom. And I, I, did, I think that's the job of the teacher. You know, I, I think that's insulting to teachers to, to, to pull a book because it, you, because it requires teachers to talk about it with their students. <laughs> that's insane to me. Yeah, I, it's not. I mean, I'm I'm reminded as well in something else that you've said in the past is that the late Andre P. Brunk told us once uh, as when we were talking about censorship in South Africa, where in fact the censorship was legislated rather than um, here, where it is not in in um, legislated, and that perhaps makes it slightly more insidious in that you don't. You don't have a defined code to to push against it. It really is far more nefarious here. But but Brun said never write from a position of fear, and and I think that's such an important thing. And Razel, in pa a, a past conversation earlier this week, as you talked about that as well, is about writers writing and how you get pushed till you explode. Do um, you want to elaborate on that a bit more? I will, and I'd like to elaborate on what David said about the community rallying behind him and his and works, because I also experienced that when When Everything Feels Like the Movies was encountering censorship. But what's interesting is that there, when I won the Governor General's Literary Award, six days, I, it all happened very fast. I won the GG in uh, November of 2014, and like three weeks later, I was at Rideau Hall. And six days after that, a peer young adult author started the petition to revoke the GG over the book's depiction of queer teen sexuality and themes of gender identity um, and transgenderism. So it there there is support, but there is also um, those who uh, wish to to censor and align themselves with book bans ban with book banners. And I think that that is because book censorship has become increasingly politicized, and it is mainly a Republican and conservative and religious uh, mission. Um, so I grew up Catholic and I know a thing or two about, uh, I know fundamentally what oppression means. And I struggled so much to, to distinguish between the criticisms that my work was facing and the censorship on my work and the uh, attack on and what felt like an attack on me personally, because it so mirrored all of my experiences as a kid growing up uh, uh, in the Catholic Church and, uh, you know, at being bullied at school for being a queer kid in Manitoba um, in the 90s and early 2000s. And it really is only writing that has ever saved me. Writing is my catharsis. It's what I do to heal. And yet it, the result of my writing often hurts me because people react to it in a way that suggests um, there's something inherently corrupt about me and therefore corruptive about anything that I might create that others need to be protected from. 
Let, let me, I'll just say one thing that I want to lift you up for a second. I just had, I spent the weekend with Ivan Coyote. Oh, and I love it. I love Ivan too. And, you know, but Ivan was, has been having a bit of a tough, I don't want to speak on behalf of them, but um, they're, they've been having a bit of a tough time as well, because it's a tough time, I think, for the LGBTQIA2S community in this regard, um, at least. And, um, and Ivan was feeling very discouraged, um, you know, and for, for, for various, for a lot of reasons that I think that you would relate to. And one of the things I told Ivan is that, you, you know, for his, and not discounting the stuff that you are having to deal with, which is, which is completely um, unfair. And I can't even, you know, from someone who's been through it a little bit, I can't even wrap my head around what, what you must be going through and in, in having to deal with this again and again. But you have no idea how many kids, people you've saved with your work, who've read your work, you know, and that I think is, um, you know, I, sometimes it's, it's good to focus on those things as much as we have a battle to fight here, but. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know. And that means so much to me for you to say that because uh, it's absolutely true. And, you know, when everything feels like the movies was published 10 years ago, and yet, you know, the backlash and, and controversy, it continues. Last year, I did the Children's Book Center, uh, Canadian Children Book Center's Book Week. I did a virtual tour with them. And uh, when I performed at PEI, I presented to 230 students in the school cafeteria. And I couldn't see them, my screen was blank. Um, and I delivered the 60 minute presentation. And when it was over, I was back in the principal's office where I spent a lot of time as a kid uh, because the principal decided to cut my presentation halfway through. And what devastated me the most is they cut it at the point where I was talking about how uh, my sexual repression as a teen led to my depression and an attempted suicide, which was very difficult to talk about and extremely vulnerable, but I made it a point to talk about that during every presentation because there is one queer kid in every room and Ivan has a novel called One in Every Room. There is one queer kid in every room who is struggling with their identity and struggling to uh, love themselves and contemplating taking their lives. And so, uh, you know, when we write stories uh, for them, it, it's really a lifeline for a lot of kids. And what what uh, people who are um, pushing for these censorships don't understand is that it, it costs lives. It, when they when when we don't have access to books, you know, we we don't have access to who we are. Exactly. And Aline, I mean, I, I want to come to you here uh, on that. In that, you've been in the trenches with human rights activism and as a book reviewer as well and, and has much changed from oh gosh let's look at 1972 when <laughs> yeah god it's uh it's Margaret. Hello, yeah, hello, hello god it's me Margaret. Hello god it's Margaret yes. came you out. Know, how, how much has changed? Um, well the the book banners have gained um, energy and they begin as an individual book, uh, sometimes one parent who had a concern or may or may not have read something, thought something was pornographic, wanted to have protect their child. Uh, now it's a, a movement, as you know, in Florida and Texas, it's gone quite, um, you know, viral. Uh, there are whole groups of parents trying to exert their control. For me, the area is about children. It's about what are we trying to protect mm -hmm. children from. And in, in my, my belief is that books are, and reading is a safe space. That's, that's where you want children to go through their first experiences of things. So by far the most number of banned books are young adult books, though, though the movement in, in those states and others now has been uh, in the news a lot about elementary school. They've now expanded it to grade 12, and now they're going after the libraries as well. Um, and we'll get to publishing in a minute, the sort of preemptive attempts to um, ha influence what's written. But, but to me, whether it's for a young child um, or, or a, a teenager, an adolescent, books are the place where they can first experience those questions of their identity, mm -hmm. their, their doubts, their fears of fitting in, their first uh, sexual feelings, their uh, all sorts of things that, that the turmoil of adolescence um, brings, there you are in the comfort of your home reading a book. This is a safe space to go through that for your one of your initial times. You've got 
people who love you, uh, ideally around you, others you can talk about. So to, to take that away is, uh, is as Re uh, Raziel was saying, put it, is, learn, is, is sort of um, giving those kids no place to be, no place to explore those. And the other thing is most of these books, most children's books and young adult books, um, explore some serious issues, abuse, identity, suicide, all, all of these things, but they generally tend to be also resilient and affirming and give, give, give some hope to the young person. It's, it's about giving them agency and developing their capacity for independent thought. So again, to remove that from their school library or their public library is to reduce their options of finding out more about themselves and exploring the world. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question, Arlene? Do you think that that's the point? Because it seems to me that if we're going to talk about book censorship, then we have to talk about the patriarch patriarchy's influence in censoring books. And I think that the reason why we're seeing such a rise in the censorship of, uh, bo of books, and particularly books for young readers, uh, is because the patriarchy is scared. Young people are dismantling old institutions and rebuilding new ones. And uh, the patriarchy, in their desperation for control, is narrowing in on books to limit what we can read, uh, and, and thereby limiting who we can be. I think I think you're right, Raziel. That's one group that's trying to exercise their control. But there are also others. I mean, whether it's through Sharia law or, or halaha or fundamentalist Christian beliefs or even just authoritarian countries who want to tell people what they should read, what should, they should think, how they should dress, where where they can travel or not. Anything that tries to to suppress your freedom is trying to control or dominate with its theory or its philosophy of life uh, over a diversity or a, or a variety of uh, minority or other opinions. It's trying to exert its control. And I think very much um, patriarchy is one of them, but there are others, other types of control that these groups are trying to exercise. You know, I, if I can just leap in here and say, from my experience again in South Africa with, with, um, with bannings and censorship, is that the more they tried to censor, the more writers resisted and wrote books and will continue to write books mm -hmm. to give voice to that. And as fast as they were banning books, we were photocopying them. Yes, I know what that says about copyright, mm -hmm. but these were extraordinary circumstances and putting them into the... In, into circulation again to, to get them out there. And in fact, it encouraged people to read in, in a bizarre way. So readers will resist and writers will resist. And, um, and I think one must, it's easy to look at the, the negative, but, it's, but there is a positive. It will, these walls will crumble. Sorry, Raziel, you. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in because it reminded me of what I just said about my presentation in PEI. Uh, I have never received such uh, a passionate response from uh, an audience. Uh, after the presentation was cut, uh, so many of the people, of the students who were in attendance contacted me on social media uh, to say that they had revolted against their administration and that they didn't believe that the presentation should be cut. And they said, now I'm gonna buy your book. So if you wanna stop <laughs> someone from reading, especially a young person, tell them that there's something that they can't read. Yes, that used to be a good way to get kids to read, is to say, here's a book, you're not quite old enough for it yet, I'll leave it on the table here, and of course your child would run to read that of course, book. Yeah. Um, and we, Stephen, yeah. Stephen King also had a, a thing very similar to what Raziel just said, which is, if, if uh, he said, if you tell ch kids to read my books, some of them will. If you tell them not to read my books, they'll flock to them in droves. Uh, so it's, it's, it's I hopeful that that will case, but there is also the you know, the self-censorship of publishers if they don't, if they're afraid to publish books that they think will not be accepted by libraries or schools. Mm -hmm. I, I want to come back to, to that, but uh, Matt, sorry, you've been looking like you had something to say there. <laughs> no, I was just, no, I was just going to mention that uh, when we when we launched the book sanctuary, we got a like. I think there is a lot of interest in these challenge books, and it was it was definitely reflected when we when we when we first launched it that several uh, first of all media companies went to Toronto like definitely wanted to focus on it and learn more about it, 
and uh and also we saw like an increase in the in the circulation of the titles thus we were buying more copies and licenses of the book so i think there's it's funny when people get upset about banned books and then they find out about it and then more people want to read it so it's uh, ben, barnes and noble used it as an advertiser they had a whole section of about a dozen books saying banned books and you could go and choose those and buy them <laughs> yeah, there are lots of um, uh, stores that have those sections now where they have oh, bad book sections. The, the thing is, like, just objectively looking at um, what happened, even with, you know, with the books that were banned in Alberta, and, and it wasn't just mine, you know, it was like Richard Van Camp, and it was like, you know, all the, it was all Indigenous writers, but I mean, uh, and, then, uh, and then Ontario, what, what you'll see is that when these books are banned, um, their sales go go up exponentially, you know. Um, and, and so oftentimes it has as much as it's unpleasant and, uh, you know, and it's stressful and all those, all those things, um, it often has the opposite effect of what administration wants to see when they make the decisions to pull these books. And Alberta was administration that was making the decisions. Um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's parents and, um, other, 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 uh, other, um, other, other, uh, other other places where it originates from, but um, almost always I, I've seen that the books, um, you know, the sales in, increase. Um, you know, so it, I think that it's uh, ironic, and it's um, I don't think I don't know why they, I don't know, keep trying to do it when they, it kind of in some ways it helps the books out. I, I'm I'm reminded as you speak of a comment by the. Um, critic uh, Ernst Fischer, who wrote something along the lines of art can do little far less than the rulers who try to suppress it and crush it, but then goes on to say that um, that art will survive and continue and uh, as fast as rulers oppress it, the readers and the people will uh, change governments and change change those attitudes, which is your rebuilding the patriarchy, Raziel, uh, I think there. but. But this all, I'm watching the time here and I want to move on to another thorny subject that is related. Um, and that is the other forms of censorship that are less acknowledged perhaps, uh, and possibly are they censorship is the question. And this is a question that uh, was raised during our prep discussion and that was about sensitivity readers. So, Who's going to leap in here? Arlene, do you want to start be happy off there? To, because and I, Raziel, I, always, I know you started as well on that. So let's go Arlene. Well, maybe I was slow to the mark, but I only learned about it recently. And I realized that it's being done quite a lot here in the United States. I'm, I'm in New York today um, or and in Canada to some degree now and in UK and probably others. The idea is that as long, along with a book uh, that a publisher is planning to write, you know, you have a line reader, you look for continuity, you have pre-readers to point out things. But now this uh, sensitivity readership is, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes it can be okay. The idea is that they red flag any of the issues that might uh, be hot button, uh, whether it's sexual or, or race or um, homophobia or um, anti-Semitism, or uh, they, there's a many, many on their list, indigenous, um, issues are part of them. It, it's okay to, of course, to run a book that's about a subject by people who may know more about parts of that book than the author. But it's not okay, in my opinion, to use uh, sensitivity reading to remove any supposedly controversial or that might bring um, that kind of questioning to the book. They, they, then you're you're asking or forcing or suggesting that your author sanitize their book or remove certain phrases that might even be actual quotes in the case that I was aware of um, because they're about supposedly controversial subjects. Um, this is a little bit dangerous. It's like it's a preemptive, <laughs> preemptive censorship um, by before we even get to see the book. And uh, I mean, what what kind of a job is a sensitivity reader? You might as well be like giving tickets to cars on the street. Like it's just so pathetic and so Orwellian. And I understand that most publishing houses, if not all major publishing houses in Canada employ them. I have never, I, 
I, I published with Penguin Random House Canada my last two novels. I've never been introduced to a, a sensitivity editor or reader. So if one has passed through my manuscript, the notes have gone to my editor, who uh, Lynn Misson at Penguin Random House Canada, who is fearless and um, tactful. So if any of that information ever came to me and if there was ever uh, a, a, a word or a, a line that needed finessing, um, it would be delivered to me. So at least it isn't um, like I have to go through like a course or something with a sensitivity reader. But I think um, ultimately it is a very Orwellian and dystopic and dangerous concept um, because it forces ultimately writers to censor themselves and that um i don't know reduces the scope of the artistic merit that they're working of, of their creation lynn is the best i lynn edits most of my books too i just wanted to mention i just wanted to mention that I, i'll say for like i i agree with i agree with both of you um i've i have in the past um requested a, a read when I'm writing, um, for example, about a character who's not from my culture. So, you know, like I, if I'm writing, uh, I'm Cree. So if I'm writing uh, about an Anishinaabe character, um, then I I will ask um, to have, whether it's a buddy of mine or whether, you know, to have someone from that community or from that from that group, that culture, back, the cultural background, because we're not pan-Indigenous. Um, to give it a read and to make sure that I've been accurate in how I portrayed, you know, cultural elements or, um, you know, um, that character, um, considering their background. Um, but so, I, but I think there's definitely a line, um, and it's a very, it's a very delicate line, um, and you have to know like where that line is, and um, you know, when when you're you're kind of giving too much power to that read, um, and you are getting to the point where you do um begin to censor your work and so I, I think that for me I think it's important that I'm like accurate and appropriate in what I'm writing about um in terms of like from a cultural standpoint mm -hmm. um but um I, I do think there's a there's a there's a balance um yeah. and it's a very important yeah. balance so so what I'm hearing is that there are there are potentially in your view the panel's view so far uh some positive to it in the fact that it, there can be a balance, but that there is also a danger of verging into what Raziel has <laughs> praised Orwellian. Um, and th there certainly can be such a, an element to it. So it's, it's, it's about finding that balance, which again, kind of brings me back, Matt, to, to libraries and committees is who are the arbiters of such a such decisions? Yeah, that's a very good question. So at Toronto Public Library, we have um, individuals who select the materials for for the collection. Um, we we are very we stress all the time that we need to kind of separate the the personal values versus the professional values about meeting the material selections policy. So you're going to select items that you may not personally agree with, but you need to put that aside and uh and uh ensure that we maintain that breadth within our collection so we have various diverse points of views some of them we may find uh offensive but it's important from a you know it's a it's it's important to have that point of view so folks can kind of make you know they could read from a historical standpoint different points of view and make, make that decision for themselves what is uh and it goes back into critical thinking skills right like we may have things that are fake news or other the other these things too but we need to promote these critical thinking skills so we can read something and say like oh boy this is not good and other things where you're like you know this is this is uh you know a valuable piece of work there's this right, so in politics that says you know just as important as who does the voting is who does the counting and unfortunately, some of the committees now that are making the decisions in Florida and Texas are all, they're not, they're not the way he de de described or Matt described. They're, they're all of one opinion and they're just removing books from the shelves. They're not, they're not a, a diverse and uh, eclectic group. I was actually just in Texas for ALA in, in Austin and um... I think the stat was like over the last calendar year, they had banned, I think, between 600 and 800 titles. Mm -hmm. 
which is like, you know, that's a, that's an astronomical number. And, and one of the about, most, I was going to say, most, sorry, sorry, I was, was going to say, just think about all the books that the kids need to read that they can't read now. Um, you know, cause I feel like so much about books is like how much we can learn about ourselves and each other. And if we don't oh. have the capability to do, to do that. Um, then I, I think we're hurting our communities in a, in a very profound way. And one of the most censored books in America is Two Boys Kissing by David Leviathan, the teen book. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you've read the book, then you know that its title is its most provocative component, which speaks to not only the uh, rampant homophobia and transphobia of those who attempt to uh, ban books, but also their myopia. M many of them don't even read the books and a title is enough to trigger them. I just actually had a panel, uh, a one-on-one -on -one discussion with uh, Dave um, last last year for at, uh, at TIFA, Toronto Festival, and um, he wrote a book recent, like I think just his newest book, which is about book banning, and it's mm. um it's a brilliant book um, that is kind of told in like a, a meta kind of way where you get to read the book that he, that they're banning as you read about the banning. And then you read about the author's relationship with, you know, somebody um, from the past at the same time. And it's all like, he's, he, he did a great job with that book and he's and, a really great guy, but yeah. Great time, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm going to, that's a wonderful segue. Thank you, David. You've given me a gap here. <laughs> We've got five minutes here where before we move to the Q and A, so just a reminder to our viewers, if you have questions, now would be a good time to, to type them up so that we can address them in the, in the Q and A session, um, but this your your book about book banning, etc. You leading me into some book recommendations. So let's start with you, David. Uh, can you recommend a book for our viewers to to go and take a look at? I I would read um, David Le 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 Leviathan's newest book. I would read that one. Um, I'm just actually. <laughs> it's funny. Like I I read so many books that I'm just I have to look up like what it, what it's called, but. Um, <laughs> It, it's um I'll, I'll find it very quickly but it's um it's a it's a great book and um it so the the kind of the premise of it is that um there's a parent who reads the last paragraph of a book and in the last paragraph of that book um they read that it's called it's called um answers in the pages i think is what it's called um and they they read that these two boys, they just, they hug. And then the parent from there, um, like goes nuts and like has the book pulled from the shelves and has like, you know, tries to get a band all these places. And there's a big hearing about it. And um, as this book's kind of going on, you get to read about, you get to read the book that um, the parent's banning. And so what, what Dave's saying is that in the practice of actually reading the book, you realize that the banning of that book based on one paragraph is ludicrous, you know? Um, and so it, I would say that book um, it, in the context of this conversation is, would be a very, very important. And I think a really good read um, to, uh, Thank to do. You. Yeah. So David Leviathan um, answers in the pages. Raziel, you're sort of on the next on my screen. So let's go to you. What's your recommendation? Um, I would recommend one of the most uh, protested young adult novels of the day. It's called This Book is Gay by the trans author Juno Dawson, and it is a manual for queer kids to help them navigate uh, an ever-changing world um, with ever-changing views on their identity. Um, and I recommend it because when I was young, I know it would have probably saved me from uh, my depression and uh, what it led to. It, it would have grounded me in this world and given me a sense of belonging. Juno Dawson recently gave an interview uh, with uh, Rolling Stone about the censorship of her book. And I just wanted to read one of her quotes because I think it's brilliant. We're all very clear this book is gay is not for children. This book is kept in the young adult section, like a lot of the books that are on those banned book lists. But of course, that isn't the agenda that people like Libs of TikTok push. They're saying that librarians are giving these books to kids, which is very vague, isn't it? Because that could mean anything. 
Throughout the book, there are content warnings and trigger warnings. But of course, that's not what people do on the internet. They screen grab it out of context. The complaints about this book are not about keeping kids safe. Because if we really wanted to keep kids safe in the United States, we wouldn't be talking about books. We'd be talking about guns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well said. Yeah, she's yeah, G. Absolutely. And, and uh, Arlene, you're next on my list. So well, I, 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 I live here in New York, two blocks from the Central Park Zoo. And there's a book, uh, a children's book called Entangle Makes Three that's caused a lot of uh, it's been banned here and there in the last uh, couple of months uh, all over Florida. It's about two male penguins who start to make a nest when the couple, the, the heterosexual penguins are nesting as well. And so the zookeeper takes one of the eggs and puts it in their nest and they bring up a little baby, that's Tango. And Tango makes three. It's a true story. It's, it's about something that really happened uh, two blocks from where I live here. And it's a book about how all families are different and it's charming. Uh, my four-year-old grandchildren adore it. Um, and uh, I thought I'd recommend a kid's book just because. All right, and Matt? Oh, do you want the authors? Sorry, uh, Justin oh. Richardson and Peter Parnell, sorry. Thank you, yes. Yeah, no, my recommendation, I've been reading books off of our Book Sanctuary collection to just better for myself to know, um, you know, to better understand these uh, these books and such. And I'm happy to hear that several of these books are actually on the Book Sanctuary collection. So that's great, as well as Raziel and David's book are on the list. But um, but uh, I want to recommend uh, uh, All Boys Aren't Blue by uh, uh, oh. Memoir Manifesto by George M. Johnson. Um, this is a moving story of an author's experience growing up as a Black queer person in America. A perspective that is not well represented in library collections. Um, there's honest descriptions of gender identity, racism, and love from the experience growing up from uh, from growing up uh, from kindergarten to adulthood. Uh, the book does have explicit content, and it's aimed uh, for people aged 14 and above. Uh, and uh, 29 school boards have banned or challenged the book, and it's on uh, American Library Association's top 10 challenged books in 20 uh, in 2021. All right. Well, thank you for that. And um, I, I would say my two books are not necessarily banned books, but certainly books that have been um, challenged and questioned over time. And they both by writers that are not North American. Well, one is North American, and that is Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, just because I think it's a fabulous book. And uh, a necessary book, one of those books that's just foundational for reading. And the, the other is um, Solomon Cheki Shoplaiki's Mahudi, that's M-H-U-D-I, which is just a fabulous tale that of a story, not so much of banning, but of how a book disappears because the writer is, is black. And it was written in 19, published in 1932, and just sort of, disappeared and then resurfaced. In fact, Nora, Zora Neale Hurston's book is very much the same. So not banned books, but books like that, that, that are older, but so foundational for so many people uh, who, who have come from historically marginalized and oppressed communities. And so with that, I think we move on to the questions. Um, Thank you all very, very much for the discussion so far. So let's take the questions. So I'm just going to take them from the bottom. Let me go uh, scroll down to the bottom here. Um, gosh. Um, so David and Raziel, you can probably both speak to this. Is what do publishers do when one of their author's books is banned and do they have an obligation to resist or do they see that as a way to ironically sell more copies? Now, uh, that was Jean Ann Cathal Kerwin and uh, David, I think you've answered that it does give some kind of a sense of a, an uptick in, in book sales, but uh, what do they do? That's the part that I don't know that has been answered. Well, it might, it might, it might uh, differ. I'm sure it does from publisher to publisher. Um, and I don't think that, uh, I, at least I would 
I wouldn't like to think that most publishers would wish the books to be banned to to help sales. Um, I think that's just like something that happens because the majority of Canadians don't like when books are banned um, and they go, go out and buy them. Um, but yeah, with, with uh, Tundra, Penguin Random House, um, you know, they were they were really huge advocates. So like, you know, they were right in there with me, you know, writing writing letters to Jerem, um, you know, like uh, pushing them to, to give us rationale. Um, you know, they were, they were uh, right there beside me the whole way. Um, and so I don't know, you know, and uh, with High Water uh, in Winnipeg, when uh, my books with them got banned in Alberta, um, they were also, you know, really great advocates uh, as well uh, for the literature. So I'd like to think that most publishers would do the same thing. Um, but in my in my in my experience, the two publishers that I was with when these book bannings happened uh, were were very supportive, and uh, you know they didn't like that it was happening, and they um, didn't sit idly by and watch it happen. They definitely were active, um, and they they uh, put a, a lot of pressure with me um, on these bodies that were uh, pulling or trying to pull or pulling the books. In Brazil, your experience that is that yours too. That has been my experience. I've been really privileged to have been so supported by my editors. And, you know, I think editors publish books for much the same reason that writers write them to give people uh, an anchor in this world, to ground them and root them in, in their placement and to help them find their way. And they take that mission very seriously. So I, I know the editors that I've worked with have taken any um, controversy or backlash or censorship attempts as personally as I have. Um, so yeah, I would definitely echo uh, David's experience. So um, here's a question that I want to pose to, I guess, uh, well, I want to start with Matt on this one, but Alexander Inglis sort of says, thinking about the, the increase in book bannings and say, uh, must we remain vigilant or do we think that banning is more of a fear than a reality in Canada, which is a, a larger philosophical question. Yeah, um, seeing that the, like we've always had challenges coming in, um, in terms of, um, you know, libraries removing um, content, uh, we 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 resist it for the most part, um, and, and you know, like when we when we're reviewing a title, we'll see if it's in, like if it's in the right place within the library. So, like in terms of sometimes when we look at it and say like, okay, is it meant to be in the children's, or if it is, if it's very clear, like for example, the uh, all all boys aren't blue is 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 a is a is a teen title. We will want to make sure that that's in the in the teen collection and stuff. So, but uh, yeah, I'd be curious on what everyone <laughs> what everyone um, thinks about that. Um, which, which kind of answers one of the other questions, which is about uh, maturity, are books sorted and selected according to maturity levels, which you've done. So the other panelists want to weigh in on this. Um, uh, what I will say is that um, uh, we need to be more than just vigilant in Canada. I think that the trucker convoy and the types of people that that attracted is something that we would think would happen in the US and not in this country, that that's sort of a mega phenomenon. And it is these types of people who are going into the school boards and demanding that books be taken out to protect their children. It may be provocative to say it, but it's it's true. It happens here and it happens in the US. And um, we're, we are at war with our freedoms, maybe not the freedoms that um, certain truckers are fighting for, but uh, the freedom to to read and uh, uh, to find ourselves in our books. And, and we are not immune. I mean, Canadians do read Canadian books, uh, which is wonderful, and our, our bestseller lists, and we read our authors of, of all levels, but we also are um, neighbors and close to the United States. We see their television and their social media as the saying goes, most rivers run north, and a lot of the things that are happening south of the border eventually have their manifestations one way or another in Canada. So it's it's not wrong to be doing things like this panel and to be vigilant um, uh, and preemptive about responding to it so that our schools and our libraries are not um, victim to the extremists. 
Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to put the book sanctuary together is to kind of like a vigilance piece in terms of uh, bringing attention to the issue and being prepared for um, if if um, a, a coordinated movement like what's going on in the U.S. happens here. That's a a, a lovely lead in in this, the answers here to Tracy Lewis Curry's question here, which is based on the conversation among the panelists, is the, is the best way to push back on censorship just to keep reading, which I personally think is, well, yes, but there's more to be done. And her question then is, or are there organizations that one can join in order to fight back? And obviously, for, first and foremost is PEN, both Canada and international comes to mind uh, as, as one organization. Any other suggestions from the panelists? Um, I would just say, just from my experience, um, it was a mobilization of community. I mentioned this before, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't done through an organization. It was done at the grassroots level, which is, you know, I think where a lot of good stuff happens. You know, I think like mm -hmm. a lot of things, that, good things that happen are like a movement of the people. Um, and, you know, I saw that happen in both cases um, where, you know, people uh, came together, mobilized and put pressure on you know, these bodies that were, were pulling these books. And in it, you know, it caused the reversal of those, those decisions pretty quickly, um, you know? So I think like, I, I don't, and in my case, it wasn't a specific organization. It was uh, a group of people who kind of came together and, you know, and, uh, and fought, for the, fought for the books. And, um, and I think that's, that's really quite effective. All right, um, anyone else want to, add any other thoughts on this? In Vancouver, we have uh, the free book libraries that are on some streets. And so put provocative books in the free book libraries and just you know talk about them, promote them on social media, be a part of the conversation because it, it's something that we have to maintain and protect ourselves from before it gets so bad that our rights uh, have been completely eroded. You know, and I'd, I'd also add here, Matt, and you can correct me, but uh, join your local library. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Certainly support your libraries, especially, again, um, if you see these challenges coming through um, and or if it gets media attention. Um, yeah, definitely worth supporting the libraries on that one. All right. Um, and then... <laughs> All right, this leads to, here's a tricky, is uh, a question that perhaps ha we haven't touched on, but are there any books that should be banned in your point of view? That's a spot, put you on the spot question there. I'll, I'll just say, <laughs> that's a tricky one, it is a tricky one. Um, but I think that, I think for me, if I see if I see a book that is outwardly hateful or you know outwardly spreading um, you know um, lies or um, has like you know really malicious intent, um, then I think that those books probably we sh should consider um, um, you know putting doing something with them. I don't know what I don't know what it is. I'm not I'm not I don't work as a librarian. I don't you know I have a lot of respect for librarians and what they do. But I think that if you do have books that are, you know, are kind of um, intentionally hateful or intentionally ignorant or whatever it might, then I think those books are, um, it bears some consideration to um, um, put them somewhere, do something with them that, and I don't know what that would be, but um, I mean, generally I'm not a fan of censorship or banning, but, um, you know, I think that that kind of, kind of falls under its, uh, its a different kind of consideration or category. But uh, isn't the problem with intention and the intention with which the book was written is that it's subjective, that we don't necessarily know what the intention is. And even if it has offended us or we consider it uh, uh, hateful and dangerous, uh, this is up for debate. I see books as being an extension as human beings and human beings aren't always such great creatures. So um, we maybe need to accept that there are books that are dark and that speak to um, 
the worst aspects of humanity. I mean, historically, we bound books in leather. They're bound in flesh. So there, there's a real connection between the human life force and the books that we write and read. Um, and so I feel like to ban or to censor any book is really to attack humanity. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's why I was saying, like, kind of finding a way to kind of categorize them differently or kind of do something with them. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't think I'd ever say to, to ban a, a, a book, but I think uh, identifying the problematic nature of maybe some, some of them that are, you know, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's really tricky. It is tricky, because there might be some that are, that are hateful or slanderous or full of lies, or you want to sort of cloister them or introduce them. It's, it reminds me of the issues over, over statues or over, you know, do you, do you write, a, do you explain or do you put something put them in some kind of a place or way that they can be introduced more carefully. Um, but it's, it, again, it's in who does the deciding and the, the literary and artistic standards have to be maintained and whether, and, and it's very, it's something very careful. It would be very, it would be rare, but I, I, I don't think it's impossible that there would be some that would be, um, that would be fomenting hate or, or giving so much um, space to, to horrible lies. That that's possible, but a pretty rare situation. And I'm looking at the time here, and I think this is that was pretty much as what we have time for here uh, as we close in. So, any uh, very quick rapid fire closing remarks at this point? We have two minutes left. What I will say is that I am born from the ashes of my book burnings and the fire that burns in me to write stories that are raw and unflinching and real can never be extinguished because these are the stories of who we are. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I, I would just say like, just like keep, keep reading books by marginalized writers um, you know, keep keep supporting that that literature. Keep providing that platform. I, I love that. You know, if you look at from week to week on the bestseller list, you have the majority of books now are by you know marginalized writers, and I think that is such a encouraging thing that is happening. And I think that real change is going to come through stories uh, and the stories that we we give to kids and the stories that we read and support. Um, you know, I I feel like um, that's going to lead us into a much better future. Um, and so, and if we see, you know, uh, books uh, being pulled or banned, uh, I, I think that, you know, I, we have to fight for those books and, um, and like, you know, read, read them even more, you know? Um, so that's, that's just what I would say. And um, I just think, I just have such a, a love and belief um, that marginalized uh, writers um, books that um, help us to see each other and other people and learn about each other and respect each other uh, are, is just so vitally important. Thank you. And Ali? I, I, I agree. I think um, we should if, encourage reading. Uh, we encourage children love stories. The place to find more stories are in books. Adults are not that different. We love hearing jokes and gossip and tales and we love to read. And I think uh, extended from that is to support the people who do the writing and to support the people who are going through their their lives with 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 difficulty um, to show to show the love to the people who need the love and to uh, not hurt people. There's there's so much hurt going on and to find the merit and the artist the artistry and the and the sharing that is intended in writing something of yourselves and giving it to others to read and experience. We should encourage that as much as we can. Well, thank you all very, very much for your comments and uh, I'll hand it back to Alana now. Thank, thank you. you. Well, that was breathtaking. Thanks uh, to all of you for an outstanding and really absorbing conversation. I think that we need to keep having in order to stem the, the, the tide of censorship. I appreciate your experience, opinions, and insight. And uh, thank you all again for participating. I will let everybody know out there to go tell your friends that this panel will be available on Zoom, Zoom our, I'm sorry, our YouTube channel in the coming days. So please go check that out. Thanks to all of you for showing up and thanks to our panelists once again. Take care and good night. Good night.
Good night. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. Bye.